And then if you look at the next page, 157, a temporary toilet. Just, I bet the neighbors just appreciated says, that one. That's how the insurance companies are being hurt by this. How does that's, that hurt the insurance company? Because the insurance company has the ultimate decision, I'm going to pay it or I'm not going to pay it. And if you can't agree, the homeowner will sue you. Don't you have a right to, to complain? Well, then I stand corrected. If you're a roofing contractor and you're dealing with the insurance companies or maybe you're the homeowner and you're questioning integrity of the contractors or integrity of insurance companies, please watch this video to the end. Thank you, Edward Fackoff, for sending this video to us. So what you about to see, it's actual cord recording between 33 carpenters and State Farm. The conversation is absolutely amazing. I love the judge. I love the defense. You have conversations like State Farm saying, well, why are we paying for toil? Is that costing insurance companies money? Dropping dimes, dropping dimes. And stuff like that. So this video is absolutely golden. If you're the contractor, please watch to understand that you are not the evil. Sometimes State Farms, all states, those companies, they trying to portray you as an evil. And even when we do everything right, we still can go and face them in court and they're still gonna accuse us. So in this case, it does not look like State Farms actually accusing contractor of doing something horribly bad. They just deny the estimate and it's very, very typical practice for companies like State Farm. They are corrupt. They're okay spending millions of dollars on advertising and basketball courts, NBAs, everywhere for you to see them. Kevin, where you get all them dimes from? Save money, drop dimes. But they're not okay to pay for the toilet, so neighbors would appreciate it, and so the crew will appreciate it. They don't wanna pay for supervision and stuff like that. In this video, they explain all of that, but the judge makes very interesting comments and asks very interesting questions. How is it different from auto insurance industry? Because, you know, if you work in the cars, it's no difference, at least on the paperwork side, than working in the house. Please enjoy the video, comment below if you have experienced something similar. And if this video helps you, don't forget to subscribe and like, and I'll see you guys in the next video. The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. You may be seated. We are ready for the uh, arguments in 33 Carpenters Construction Inc. versus State Farm. And I believe, Ms. Mr. Nate, you're going first. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, counsel. Uh, I am Ed Nate, and I represent 33 Carpenters in this case. I'd like to start with a summary of the facts. Uh, Brent and Sarah Claussen purchased a homeowner's insurance policy from the defendant with a policy term of December 19, 2015 through December 19, 2016. The policy contained a one-year contractual limitation for filing suit. On March 15, 2016, a storm went through the area where the Claussens lived. On June 29, 2016, Matt Shepard of 33 Carpenters knocked on the Claussen's door and asked permission to inspect their premises for hail damage caused by the storm of March 15, 2016. Prior to Mr. Shepard knocking on the door, the Shepherds, <coughs> excuse me, the Claussen's had no idea their house had been damaged in the hailstorm on March 15. That day, the Claussen's and 33 Carpenters entered into an agreement authorizing 33 Carpenters to replace the damaged roof and allowing 33 carpenters to communicate directly with the defendant. The Claussens then submitted a claim to the defendant, State Farm. A State Farm representative came out on July 12, 2016 to inspect the premises. Mr. Shepard was there and met the State Farm representative at the Claussen residence. The Claussens were not there that day. The record does not show any evidence that Mr. Shepard actually negotiated or otherwise adjusted the Claussen's claim at that time. I'm sure if, the, if State Farm had such evidence, they would have put it into the record as an affidavit or a deposition. There is no such evidence in the record. 
The next thing that happens, and this appears at page 118 of the appendix, stated July 15, 2016, State Farm sends out an invitation for any contractor of the Claussons to contact the claims representative with any questions. That document is entitled Structural Damage Claim Policy, and it's addressed to Sarah Clausen. And it states, we will provide you with a detailed estimate of the scope of the damage and cost of repairs should the contractor you select have questions concerning our estimate. They should contact your, rep your representative directly. So note, State Farm is basically saying if you've got a contractor, have them contact us directly. The contractor should contact State Farm directly with any questions. State Farm sends this invitation out again on March 27, 2017 to the clauses. So they're saying it's okay for your contractor to contact us directly. On July 15, 2016, State Farm did prepare an initial estimate of the loss and issued an actual cash value payment to the Clawson. This was eventually transferred to my client, 33 Carpenters. On February 22, 2017, 33 Carpenters received an assignment of claims and benefits from the Clawsons for their insurance claim against State Farm. And that's basically why we're here. 33 Carpenters filed suit against State Farm on March 13, 2017. More things happen. 33 Carpenters prepares an updated supplement stating there's additional damage. State Farm goes back out there and basically agrees there's additional damage um, and increased the actual cash value by 15, over $15,000. A check was made payable to 33 Carpenters and the Clausen's Mortgage Company. Uh, with that check, there was a cover letter that stated uh, no actions by the State Farm were going to waive any of the policyholders' rights under the policy. Later, my client prepares a third estimate, and we're now up to $77,000. State Farm filed a summary judgment motion in this case, and it really was based upon two things. One, that my client, 33 Carpenters, acted as a public adjuster without a public adjuster's license, so the assignment from the Clausens to my client was invalid. Second, they claimed based upon accord and satisfaction, the fact that the second check was cashed was accord and satisfaction. The district court held that 33 Carpenters did act as a public adjuster without a license prior to the assignment, and thus the assignment was invalid as a matter of law. The district court found there was an issue of material fact as to regard to the accord and satisfaction argument, and State Farm has not appealed that ruling. To me, the main thing here is the argument of State Farm appears to be that 33 Carpenters acted as a public adjuster. Basically, 33 Carpenters was not licensed as a public adjuster, so 33 Carpenters cannot take an assignment of a claim. I know of nothing in Iowa law which requires that a person or an entity be a public adjuster or even a licensed contractor to take an assignment of an insurance claim for residential damages. That's basically what they're claiming here. You are, are there, not are a there any, on this issue um, that the court decided summary judgment, would you agree it's a question of law, there's not any factual dispute in play? In play? My client would argue that it was not a public adjuster, I think because of the advertising problem, I think it is more of a question of law. There really are not facts in dispute here, Your Honor. I would, I would tend to agree with you, yes. Okay. Um, Iowa has long held that post-loss assignments... What, is, what, is, what would be your test of when somebody is a public adjuster? Well, I think, the, the, I think it is set out in the statute very clearly. It's extremely broad. I think every auto body person in the state of Iowa is considered a public adjuster under the law. Because if they see a spark plug's damaged and the insurance company hasn't figured that out and they call them, you're a public adjuster. It is extremely broad. And I think we have some problems with the advertising that went on here, Your Honor. I'd be truthful. Um, to me, the guts of this is that Iowa has long held post-loss insurance claims are assignable. And uh, I know the State Farm policy, and I think every policy I've ever seen still clings to the language that you can't assign our policy and uh, you can't do it without our permission. 
But the Supreme Court for years and years has held that's not really the law. Uh, they keep putting this language in there, and our insurance commissioner apparently still lets them, but that's clearly not the law of Iowa. The post loss can be assigned. Counsel, you had um, at the trial court had argued that um, only the insurance commissioner could enforce this right. law, and that the district court didn't explicitly reach that issue, although maybe implicitly did. Is that a, a question we need to answer? Yes, absolutely. And how was it preserved by your by you in this case? It was preserved, Your Honor, because we. Well, if you look at our brief, we certainly have it in our brief, Your Honor, and. and I guess the, the preservation issue would be if, if the district court didn't rule on it and you didn't ask, do a follow-up well, motion, a 1904. I still want to call them 179Bs, but... Um, I understand what you're saying, Your Honor. Yeah. To me, the statute is very specific as to what, what the penalties are to be. And if the court has stepped beyond those, clearly... We can appeal from that, and we did, Your Honor. I think it's, I do think it's preserved. Um, Isn't it implicit in the court's ruling by ruling that it's void that the court can do it, not the insurance commissioner? Absolutely. I mean, the court clearly went beyond the penalties that the insurance commissioner authorized. The insurance commissioner is supposed to do the penalties, which involve cease and desist orders, and they've issued many of these, uh, and fines. And when you look at the regulations that the insurance commissioner has passed to enforce the act, they basically just followed what's in the act. Um, would, would you, um, I mean, is it undisputed that, that 33 Carpenters is a residential repair contractor within the meaning of 103A71? I would agree with you, Your Honor. Yes, that's and, what we do. We and do, you, and we you do don't commercial have, and residential. Mm -hmm. And you don't have a public adjuster license? We do not, yeah. Should Should is that say, burdensome to acquire one? or uh, be truthful, the president of our corporation is a convicted felon, and I don't think he could qualify for one. Should, he get, should we have one? I have certainly urged them to, find, to get one or to set their entity up separately. My clients don't always do exactly what I tell them to do, Your Honor, but I understand your point. One of the things I want to get to, Your Honor, is, is the line of cases that they cite as to uh, voiding contracts couple of points on those. One, uh, it's, use, it's always the person, for example, in the, in the, Dave, in the uh, Minks case is a good example, which is in their brief, M-I-N-C-K-S. You've got an unlicensed grain dealer trying to enforce a contract against a person entered into a contract. So you've got the two parties fighting, okay? And so the one who doesn't want the contract enforced because you're not licensed, is coming in and saying, don't enforce this. This case is different. State Farm is not a party to this contract, to the assignment, correct? And State Farm is not damaged by this assignment, if you think about it. I know they don't like us because we're fairly aggressive and we don't just back down. But all we take in assignment is whatever rights the insured had. We don't gain any additional rights. How are they prejudiced by this? They're not. They don't like us because we actually will stand up to them. I get that. When you look at the other cases, Brigansel, that's in their brief, that's one where somebody's trying to practice law, and they're like, you can't collect, you don't have a law license. Uh, Davis, architecture uh, situation where they tried to say something about it, you didn't have an architectural name or it something. It still yeah. isn't the basic principle of contract law is that it, it, sort of illegality is a defense to contract enforcement, am, am I right? I mean, and so that's, that's essentially the argument. Now, wh whether there's a private cause of action to sue someone over that specific illegal conduct is a different issue from whether a contract is enforceable, and, and that's, that's what they're claiming Very good here. point, Your Honor. And this case is not in our brief. I'm going to be honest with you, but generally, there's a law out there, the general rules of third parties such as start State Farm cannot invoke the defense of illegality. And I'm going to cite you a case. I'm going to tell you it's not in our brief. Matthias versus Dickerson, 298 Pacific 2nd, 219, Kansas, 1956. Well, I mean, and it cites a U.S. Supreme Court case. But your claim is they're not a third party anymore, that you have a valid assignment, so you stepped into the shoes of the insured, right? 
But what they're fighting over is the assignment. They're not a party to the assignment. Mr. Ney, can you stay by the microphone because that's our record. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I, and could you repeat that citation? I, I only yeah, got and I, 298 P. Second. 219. It's out of Kansas in 1956. Uh, and it does cite a U.S. Supreme Court case. There's a whole line of cases in there. And so to me, the difference is that they're not a party to what I, what might be the illegal contract. If there's an illegal contract here, it's the first one where we enter into an agreement with the insured to do this while we're out there. If the, insu if the insured, the Claussens, wanted to come after us, I think they could raise it. One of the interesting things of this whole line of cases, and we have several of these, trust me, it's never our clients, the insureds, who are mad at us. It's always the insurance companies. And the clients we have are not in here fighting with us. It's always State Farm, our good friends at American Family, et cetera. Now, and then we get to the Minx case, uh, which is in their brief. And if you look at the, the uh, district court's decision, it's basically this assignment is invalid, and so you lose, period, end of story. Um, the Minx case talks about the balancing test. We need to balance out what's going to happen here if we invalidate this assignment. And if you think about what happens, they win, assignment's invalidated, the, clause, the claim would go back to the Claussens, one year statute of limitations, they're out. See ya. Windfall for State Farm. If you don't invalidate it, we continue with the case. Certainly the insurance commissioner, if she so desires, can come after us. We understand that. But when you balance out what the good and the bad here is, and we have cases where the appraisals are coming back at over a million dollars, and if, if the assignments are invalid, you know, the insurer is going to have this huge windfall, and they're going to raise the one-year statute, or some of them are two, and they're going to win. And that's what's going to happen here. So... Um, Rambling through my badly written notes. I apologize for that. Anyway, basically, um, I, I do think it comes down to is the assignment invalid? And, and, I, and I don't think it is because a couple of things. One is that it's between us and the Claussens, not State Farm. State Farm is not hurt by the assignment. We don't take any greater rights than than um, the, the Claussens had. Um, generally, uh, third parties could not step in and, and claim illegality as a defense. So I'll sit down. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nate. Ms. Walrich? Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, counsel. There's an entire statutory scheme in this state that demonstrates the intent of the legislature and the public policy of this state regarding the role of a residential contractor in a storm damage residential repair claim. Three statutes, Iowa Code 522C, governs public adjusting conduct. It says what constitutes public adjusting conduct is defined very broadly, well beyond negotiation, and it says if you're going to engage in that kind of a conduct, you need to get a license from the state of Iowa to do so. Then there's 103A.71, governs residential contractors, which is what 33 Carpenters just agreed that it is, and says if you're a residential contractor, then you cannot aid or assist or investigate a claim, an insurance claim, on behalf of your repair customer. I, I mean, maybe this case is, is, doesn't present too big a problem, but it, it, it does seem Mr. Nate's right. The statute is very, very broad. I mean, if my car is damaged and I take it to the body shop and the body shop then deals with my auto insurance folks on, on makes the communications and they work out how much is going to be paid and, and what's going to be done. Have they, are they now a public adjuster? Well, I, I I mean, there is obviously a, um, a whole scheme of what kind of conduct happens in these various types of cases. I mean, that's a very small case usually if it's a auto auto damage. With my you know. car, it would be a small case. 
<laughs> but when you have something like this, a residential um, roof and siding, I mean, that's basically the exterior of an entire home. And you don't have, in this case, somebody who's just looking at the damage and saying, well, I think we saw something here that the insurance company didn't, say, didn't see or wasn't going to pay for originally. You've got somebody here who's entering into a contract saying, sure, we'll do the work. We'll do it for the insurance proceeds. And then they've got every incentive to jack up the amount that they can get from the insurance company. You have, you have every right to contest what the amount is because you have your own people. I mean, I had a client who had a Rolls Royce who got wrecked once, and we were talking over $80,000 worth of damage. So some of these cars, you know, may be worth more, and it was adjusted just that way. He took it to the body shop. The body shop dealt with the, the insurance company, and the, the claim was paid. And that's how it's done, at least in that business. And why shouldn't it be different in the home repair business? Well, I, I'm glancing at the statute quick here, here Your Honor. I, the public adjuster statute, I don't recall if this is the one, um, possibly limits itself to um, real property, but I, I'm not sure about that. It's, so we're not concerned about uh, um, auto adjustment claims, well, right? Well, not, I mean, definitely not in this case, right? I mean, in this, in, in, and this is what I would like to get back to, is the statutory scheme that we have in this case, that it deals exactly with residential contractors and residential uh, storm damage repair because you've got the two statutes they already talked about and now you've got a third statute No, it was not in effect at the time that 33 carpenters engaged in this conduct But it is another piece of the puzzle that tells us exactly what the public policy of the state is and what the legislature intends and that's the new 515.137 a that says residential contractors cannot take post loss assignments except in very narrow circumstances, and when they do take it, they have a very narrow assignment, and that's basically to be listed as a joint payee on the check. So, I mean, we've got this whole scheme here, and we've got a residential contractor that just really pretty egregiously violated it, um, starting with knocking on the homeowner's door, and that very day getting the homeowner to enter into uh, um, an agreement which provided that 33 carpenters, um, or excuse me, authorized the, the homeowners insurers to communicate with 33 carpenters to include discussions regarding scope of work and payment. And then you've got this insurance contingency, which authorized 33 carpenters to obtain appropriate property damage adjustments. I mean, that's all conduct that clearly falls within that public adjusting statute and that's prohibited by 103A.2. Could, could you address the argument that only the insurance com commissioner can enforce these laws? The insurance commissioner's rights are to impose penalties for people who violate this type of these, this, the public adjusting statute. So they could definitely knock on 33 Carpenter's door and, and impose penalties on them. 33 Carpenters put State Farm in the position that it's in today by filing this lawsuit and seeking to recover under an insurance contract to which it has no privity and is claiming privity now by this assignment. And so 33, or excuse me, State Farm has every right to raise every defense to that, one of them being your vehicle that you're using to get to us is an invalid, illegal vehicle because you obtained it in violation of all of these statutes. Can the illegality defense be asserted by State Farm? It has to be because they have to have they, – they're not a party – 33 Carpenters is not a party to this insurance contract. To recover on an insurance contract, you have to have an insurable interest. They have no insurable interest but for this assignment. The assignment's invalid, illegally gotten under the law, and so – that's how we raise it, and that, I mean, it's a valid defense that State Farm has that any of these insurance companies have that are, you know, here today on the other cases that are being submitted. The way I read the statute, it says real or personal property. Okay. So it would apply to automobiles. Well, then I stand corrected. Um, but, I, but I still believe, particularly in this case and particularly, particularly in the other cases that are before you today, we have much more than somebody who's looking at a vehicle in the body shop. We have somebody who's going out canvassing neighborhoods, knocking on doors, getting people to enter into agreements with them, authorizing them specifically to obtain property adjustments, um, who are submitting 
uh, estimates back and forth, increasing their costs repeatedly, um, conduct well beyond what would happen. What happens if 33 carpenters did all this work, and the work's done, and at the end of the work, um, they're not getting paid by the homeowners. So instead of suing the homeowners, they say, well, we'll just take assignment of your claim against the insurance company. So they're really not negotiating anything or adjusting. Would that be okay? I mean, to have a valid assignment, you've got to you've got to pay for it, right? You have to pay, you have to give some sort of consideration. The consideration is not suing the homeowner. Mm -hmm. I will not, you know, we do see that all the time in bad faith cases or, or cases where there's excess judgment. You make an agreement not to go after the tortfeasor and go after the insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. And that, this is no different, I think. So would that be a problem if, if they said, in, we'll forbear suing you if you give us the right to sue the insur assignment to, to sue under your insurance policy. I mean, just sort of talking through it. If you've got a, if you have a residential contractor who's truly in the role of a residential contractor, and they're going out, they're looking at the roof, they're coming up with their own estimate of this I'm is how much. I, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm talking through it just so that to make sure that I understand the question. Um, is coming up with their bid some submitting it, entering into a contract with the homeowner, performing the work, and then the homeowner, I mean, I still think, I don't think so. I think that the homeowner, the homeowner's the one that's on the hook because the homeowner's the one that entered into the contract. Is there any statute prohibiting that assignment when the, the insurance company has nothing to do with the insurance company unless there's a letter like you sent, have the contractor contact us, but as long as there's no, uh, you know, going by the contractor to the insurance company, can they make that assignment after the work's done? I mean, after the work's done and everything's been performed. Forbear in suing the homeowner mm -hmm. and only take their claim against the insurance company. I, in, though, in, that, in that very narrow instance, I think that they probably can. I think that that probably would work. It's a post-loss assignment. All the work's been done. The homeowner's got their repaired home. They've, you know, I mean, once, I, once the damage is done, it's a post-loss assignment, because the loss is the damage to the roof. But here, here, the damage to the roof—they kept increasing the cost, and they they obtained the assignment. The point is that they attained the assignment in violation of the statute, and then they kept increasing the the. I read cost. your your exhibit one, page one eighteen letter that if there's any problem with what we think it's worth, have the contractor call us. I mean, is that letter sort of like I didn't really mean it? I think that letter was if you have if you have questions about what we've included or what our what our work is intending to be, then give us a call. I don't think it's an invite an invite, invitation to adjust the claim. I mean, why would an insurance company invite a residential well, contractor to violate the law yeah. and that directly negotiate? That letter is negotiate. similar in the automobile, or, and I, I, hate, I hate going back there, but you know the adjuster comes out, we'll pay extra for the car. And there's further damage, the person who's doing the repair contacts the insurance company, and the insurance company either approves or doesn't approve it. It's not allowed under the law. I mean, uh, under the law, the, the contractor, whether it's the, the auto body shop or whether it's a residential contractor, they've got to, their dealings are with the homeowner. Their dealings are with the homeowner. And I guess if they're doing something beyond that, they're dealing directly with the insurance company, maybe there's a problem with them, with what they're doing you'd, with the you'd law. You started also. off by noting these interlocking statutes. So you've got the public adjuster, which may include personal property as well as real, but then the residential contractor, that doesn't include um, auto repair, does it? It's it, by definition homes, right? Right, and it's, and it's very definitely limited to catastrophes, including hailstorms, tornadoes, and the like. Catastrophes and whatnot, but um, what, what's the the uh, what was the goal of the legislature? Why why did they step in? Exactly for this particular reason, because you have an out of state contractor coming in, taking advantage, either of unsuspecting homeowners or, in our from my particular viewpoint, insurance companies, knocking on doors, canvassing neighborhoods, promising or entering into all these contracts to do work. They weren't able to get to it in our case because that's why we ended up with that second estimate and then we've had to increase the cost of repairs to include siding because of a matching issue. So that increased the um, 
the claims expense in this case or the repair expense in this case. And, um, and then we end up in this situation where we have escalating repair costs. So it's increasing those costs. We have escalating claim costs because our claims adjusters are having to go out repeatedly. And then we end up in a lawsuit that all increases the cost to the insurance company, and in turn, it gets passed on to policyholders. Justice how is Wiggins, I may, I'm going to just ask a quick question. He mentioned a little bit ago something to the effect of, but don't you have a right to, to complain about that, that claim that may be made? I mean, if you, to me, the, the things you're talking about, I haven't heard you once say that 33 went out and took a ball-peen hammer to the roof and made it worse than it was. It seems to me they're bringing to the attention of the insurance company something perhaps they did not see, am I correct? That it's, or otherwise you could reject it. Well, well, sure, we could, and we did, and that's why we're here, because we did reject it. But, let, but if, you look at the, if you look at the third estimate, for example. You know, can I ask you a question before you get there? How is this different than the homeowner hiring this contractor and getting their own estimate, giving it to the insurance company? The insurance company says, yeah, we'll pay it, when the contractor gets on the roof or whatever they're fixing, there's more cost because of matching or some hidden damage. So the homeowner calls the insurance company and says, this is the further damage. And then even the third time there's a further damage, but the homeowner is making the call rather than the contractor, which, which seems to contravene your letter you sent out because you wanted to deal with the contractor. I mean, how is that any different? Just because they signed the piece of paper, you're going to be off the hook? That's what exactly is supposed to happen. The homeowner is the one that, the homeowner is the one that's negotiating the claim, not the not the contractor. But how does that's, that hurt the insurance company? Because the insurance company has the ultimate decision: I'm going to pay it or I'm not going to pay it. And if you can't agree, the homeowner will sue you. Because in this instance, in this instance. State Farm agreed, said it wouldn't pay it, and it ended up in this lawsuit. But it takes us back to this estimate that I'd like I'd like you to look at. This third estimate, it's in. If you look at page 156 of the appendix, I mean, we have these ever increasing costs, and so let's look, for instance, at, at one of the increases. Paragraph 43 of 156 of the appendix, a safety monitor, somebody to come out for 24 hours and basically stand on the roof and make sure that nobody comes close to the edge of the roof falling off. Do we really think that that person was there? And then if you look at the next page, 157, a temporary toilet for a day, or well, I guess it just said. But the neighbors just appreciated said, that one. I just had my roof replaced, and I don't recall, I know there wasn't a temporary toilet in front of it, and. I don't recall one being there being one in the neighborhood where anybody else was having theirs replaced. So that that's what I'm saying. That's how the insurance companies are being hurt by this because they're increasing these repair costs. And if the insurance companies don't stand up to it, that ultimately all gets passed on. I'm sorry, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any rebuttal? Very short, Your Honor. Just a couple of things. One, we are not an out-of-state insurance company. We are from Iowa. Very proud of it. And we asked why these laws are passed. I believe in good faith the legislature passed these laws to try to protect the public and not insurance companies, which I think is what it's being used for here today. I appreciate all your attention and good questions. Obviously, you guys paid a lot of attention to this, and I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The case is deemed submitted.